um, um, and uh, I want to say first of all what an extraordinary honour it is for me to be invited to this ITAR, hosted by the Australian Youth Culture Society. Um, and I, I want to uh, first of all then um, acknowledge the British Lioness, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung speaking people um, of the unceded lands here in Nara, um, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, uh, particularly because for the last 22 years I've been able to live and work uh, in this uh, wonderful country and in this wonderful society. And it is, uh, I believe, one of the best places to live, particularly uh, because of uh, it is such a multicultural community. I want to acknowledge uh, our hosts, uh, the Honourable Ross Spence, MP, uh, Minister for Multicultural Affairs, Minister for Community Support and Minister for Youth, Mr um, Craig Ondachi, Shadow Minister for Multicultural Affairs, and Citizenship, Shadow Minister for Energy and Renewables and Shadow Minister uh, for Communities Recovery, and Ahmed Hester, Executive Director of the Australian Youth Cultural Society. Um, and, and, and also I want to acknowledge all of you. Uh, it's uh, events like this uh, that uh, give me uh, some, some hope uh, that uh, it's possible to have faith in humanity, um, given all of these terrible things happening in the world, uh, at least here amongst people like yourselves in this beautiful city, uh, we have a, an evening where we can acknowledge uh, the kinds of truths that have been expressed so well uh, by speakers before me here this evening. Um, and uh, for which this uh, dinner is a celebration. Now, um, obviously I'm Aboriginal, I grew up Aboriginal, I grew up in Queensland, I'm born in Brisbane, and as I was just explaining to Craig, uh, I, I lived in uh, quite a number of places uh, in Queensland as a child, um, and traveled uh, with my family, right out to the west into the country where my grandmother and my mother's siblings, especially the older ones, uh, lived and worked uh, on, on country as uh, station domestics. Um, so I know about country life and also I've lived in the cities. And I, I do know uh, from my own childhood, um, how Aboriginal people and Muslim people um, had a friendly relationship. So if I could start with an early memory, memory from my childhood, I want to tell you about the tinkers who came to our community. So I would say without exaggeration that I I grew up in a part of Queensland that, although apparently in the 20th century, still had many of the ways of life that belonged to the 19th century frontier. So Aboriginal people were um, indentured labourers, lived on the outskirts of town, in um, British camps. Um, there were forms of segregation in all parts of the town. Um, on the street, um, so Aboriginal people walked in country towns on one side of the street and white people on the other side of the street. So in these small country towns, we were treated sometimes to um, visitors such as the fairs, the travelling fairs, occasionally a travelling circus, and Every year, we look forward to the travelling tinkers. Perhaps many of you don't know about tinkers, but tinkers were often Muslim people 
to travel in carts with horses and carts or motorised uh, vehicles later, um, and they came to repair our metal, our metal work. Pots, pans, tanks, chains, and so on. And uh, they, they were referred to as Afghans. They may not have been, but that's how they were referred to. And, and uh, obviously continued to practice their own customs. And, and, and for some reason I noticed how well Aboriginal people and the, and the Tinkers, you know, my, my, the people in my camp and, and the Tinkers uh, were very, very friendly um, and there was great kindness. So, um, one of the things that was often said amongst my wider family group was, you know, we think they've got some Afghan uh, heritage. I'm like, I didn't know what an Afghan was. I had no clue what they were talking about. I, but I asked, why? Why do you say that? And they'd say, oh, look at your nose, you know. Um, and so it, it, it was a joke, really. You know, it was kind of a joke in a way because, you know, we would all joke about each other's noses because some people had the big flat nose and some people didn't. Um, and and uh, anyway, so I grew up with a friendly feeling about uh, these people who would visit once a year. Much later in life, when I started to work uh, in Arnhem Land, first of all in the 1970s as a field officer for Fred Hollows, um, uh, when he did his first eye health survey across Australia, um, and then throughout the decades, uh, I met people who also spoke about their Muslim relations. Now, I noticed that here in Melbourne, there are uh, Muslim associations who recognise this country, and of course, so few other Australians know anything about it. And I feel that uh, I should raise this here this evening because I don't understand why this is not taught in our schools. So let me begin at, um, at the point where I want to begin in telling you about what I learned in Arnhem Land over some decades. Muslim people from our north were coming here for hundreds of years before the British came here, and Aboriginal people had, by and large, not always, but by and large, very good relationships with them. Uh, relationships that look, uh, in the first instance, like, uh, very durable trading relationships, um, perhaps even treaties, uh, but certainly involving great uh, cultural exchanges that, uh, that result in um, cultural influences that persist to this day. So um, to our north, there was uh, spoken throughout the archipelago in trade language, which was made up of Arabic words, Dutch words, um, Hindu words, and, and words from the local languages, and of course later, Bahasa, uh, Indonesia. And there are hundreds of those words from that trade language are incorporated into Arabic languages in the north. Um, for instance, uh, they're Aboriginalized. Uh, so, for instance, uh, I believe uh, brachi, which we say for rice, comes from the Arabic, or, or at least the Middle Eastern language for rice, brachi. So, um, and there are hundreds of those words, as I say, and uh, indeed uh, from the Hindu. Uh, the, the word for money is still in, in North East Arnhem Land today is Wuhia. Yeah. And, and, um, and also, uh, there are ceremonies, songs, 
and sacred objects that are heavily influenced by these Muslim people who came from what was the Kingdom of Goa in um, um, Kalmatan, uh, an ancient kingdom which, uh, when I was working in Darwin in the 1990s, celebrated uh, the, uh, in about 1998, they celebrated 500 years of the Kingdom of Goa. And the, the king and the queen hosted an enormous uh, festival and invited Aboriginal people to it because of a very long relationship between the Kingdom of Goa and Kalimantan, this Muslim kingdom, and the Aboriginal peoples of Northeast Armland. And so people from Gunnawitu, Nilingizi, and nearby communities attended and performed together with. Uh, the Makassan people, um, the stories that bind them together. So Makassans came down from those parts of our north on the trade winds, the monsoonal winds every year, um, and set up um, camps uh, and, and processing um, camps for the highly desirable um, sea slug called Bash the Mare or tree cane, which they took back to the archipelago and which was then traded on to China. Um, and this persisted for, for hundreds of years, and there were intermarriages, there are Aboriginal people buried in the cemetery in Kalimantan, and uh, the, uh, the in the songs of the Nungawa people, who do who are famous uh, in many parts of North Australia for for their dance that welcomes the Macassans to the shore, um, they, they sing one song in which you can hear the call to prayer, the sound of the call to prayer. And uh, so I thought I should tell you that because it, you know. There are a number of things to say about it. One is that people imagine that Aboriginal people were isolated here, the timeless land, mythology, and so on. It's simply not true. There were many other groups that came to our northern shores as well, but I want to mention particularly the Macassans and the Islamic uh, cultural influences they brought uh, to, our, to our peoples in the north, um, and which I have to absolutely loved and, and enjoyed for some decade, decades, as I say, and I encourage you to one day see the Nungawa dances um, and hear their songs. But this could be achieved if uh, this part of our history were included in our school curriculum, because the history of our country is not 250 years old, it's more than 65,000 years old, and it would be wonderful if all of the peoples who um, lived here and contributed to the society that we have today were acknowledged in the teaching of history. There's another great influence of Islamic people in Australia that I came to know when I lived in Central Australia for seven years, and I was reminded of it tonight when the dates were passed around to break the fast. In the 19th century, again they are referred to as Afghans, they could be Pashtun, they could be something else. We, um, and there are some historians who know more than I do. They came to Australia and they brought camels with them. And they became the major transport network across the entire continent. And uh, this was before railway lines, before the telegraph line, uh, before motorised vehicles, and the camel, uh, the camels were used to transport people, goods, um, and of course messages right across the country. And the Afghan cameleers became again very friendly with Aboriginal people and, and married Aboriginal women. Indeed, I, I, I worked with Aboriginal women in Central Australia who were the daughters of such marriages, 
and they told me that their mothers made money travelling with their with their husbands on the panels across Australia by taking bingo scalps because of the bounty on bingo scalps, and that's how they they made money as they travelled across the country. And what they did, which I think all of you should know about, was plant dates, um, groves of date palms in the oases. So if you're travelling across the desert, you'll come to an oasis, and many of them will have a date palm grove planted by those Afghan camelias. And it is, you know, an absolutely wonderful sight to see those beautiful palm trees around wood holes and to arrive at the right time of year to, to eat the dates. Um, of course, you know, you have to know what you're doing, but anyway. Um, um, so, and in fact, uh, when I lived in Alice Springs, I hope it's still there, there was a beautiful palm, date palm grove on the south side of Alice Springs. Um, so, there are many such Aboriginal families. I, I should also mention the Muslims in Broome who came with the pearling industry. Um, and many of them came from uh, parts of Malaya and, the, and what is now, of course, Malaysia. And they also married Aboriginal people. And uh, you would have heard of famous Aboriginal people um, from that part of the world. In fact, in uh, Brand New Day, the Aboriginal musical, there are such people who are the you know, principal characters. And in Broome, too, uh, the influence of Muslim culture is very evident. So I wanted to mention those things to you because I would love for this, all of our children in Australia to learn about these aspects of our history because if they did so, they would come to understand that if they want to acknowledge us, they should also acknowledge our relations. And our relations are, amongst many others, Muslim peoples from different parts of the world. <coughs> they are ancestral people in um, many of our societies, and uh, they are very important to Aboriginal people. And so the respect that you show for us must include respect for them. So uh, if all of our children weren't that kind of respect, I think we would see far less conflict in the world and completely unnecessary conflict. We should be able to uh, resolve our differences. So, about the treaties in Arnhem Land. To, still today, at, at funerals on the coastline in Arnhem Land, people have coloured flags which are used at the funerals. Those flags are the flags of the fleets of prow uh, led by. Uh, Macassan captains, um, and each fleet adopted was adopted by a clan, and so the clan flies the flag of that prow. So people even bury their dead under a Macassan flag from from the fleets that used to come. And there's a series of Aboriginal courts, each one adopting a fleet across Arnhem Land, and I documented that in, in the catalogue for our, our exhibition on, the, on, on that part of our history um, called Tree Pain. Uh, some years ago, in 2012, it was at the Melbourne Museum. Um, I, I wish I could republish it, and uh, perhaps I should, so that there is a text to share um, these stories uh, with many other Australians. So it often surprises me that so few Australians know anything about this, this history. I do think it's tremendously important in addition to having respect that this kind of understanding and acceptance of the true nature of our past with its 
just even these aspects of its multiculturalism that I've explained to you, and there's so much more to say about the multiculturalism of the past. So it's been a very great honour to be able to speak to you about these matters. Uh, if I should ever have the opportunity to raise uh, in formal circumstances the need to include this kind of history in our curriculum for our children, I do hope you will support me. So thank you once again for inviting me to this iftar. It's a, been a very great honour. Um, again, uh, Ramadan Mubarak.